Okay, good. You can go to the first slide. Okay, uh, thank you very much for all the participants who took time off to join this uh, webinar this morning. Uh, first few slides, I'll be introducing uh, the concept of toxicology, what toxicology is. What, can, all of, can you hear me? Can you hear me okay? Can you hear? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, can you respond? Can you hear me? Okay. I am unable to hear you. So we can hear you, sir. You can hear? Yes. You can turn on. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. The uh, first few slides are introducing the background to toxicology. Uh, toxicology. I am getting a background uh, resound. Now is it okay, sir? Can I start? Yes, yes, you can start, sir. Okay. Uh, toxicology has been known in India over 2000 years ago, unlike other countries. Uh, like Chanukya, over 2000 years ago, knew about the poison if given in small quantities can provide protection from poisoning. It's a matter of dose, although he did not use the word dose in those days, but the concept of dose was introduced in the 15th century by a scientist named Paracelsus. Is my, is, my is my voice audible? Yes, sir. Okay, good. In the 15th century, a medical doctor by name Dr. Paracelsus a physician, uh, he introduced the concept of dose, where he indicated the poison is in everything and nothing is without a poison. It's only the dose that makes either a poison or a remedy. Next slide, please. I'll be talking the dose and dose response in the series of slides. So now in terms of toxicology, toxicology is a study of the adverse effects of chemicals on living systems living not only means only man could be uh, dogs cats animals bacteria fungi frogs you name it and the environment so we are we are interested in studying the mechanism of action of exposure to chemicals as a cause of acute and chronic exposure i will describe the word acute and chronic in the am i able okay yes sir Okay, good. And the toxicology study uh, understand use the chemicals in general, drugs in particular, understanding the physiology and pharmacology of the toxic agents, and also toxicology is used in recognition, recognition and identification of quantitation of hazards from from occupational exposure to chemicals and drugs. Uh, toxicologists play a pivotal role. In the, in the discovery of drugs and pesticides and other chemicals. And finally, we are involved in the development of standards and regulations to protect humans. Talking of the standards and regulations, uh, toxicologists are involved in the testing of uh, vaccines, in particular COVID vaccine right now, all across the world. And after determining the, evaluating the vaccine, determine the dose of the vaccine to be given to humans. Next slide, please. Now we can ask the question, why toxicology? Why animals? The reason being, humans have, a, humans have a similar biological and physiological systems like the cardiovascular, gastrointestinal, renal system, CNS in general, but not the cognition aspects. As a result, we use animals as a surrogate species. In the olden days, uh, we were, I'm talking about over 200 years ago, people actually used prisoners or humans in, uh, directly because in those days, the biology was not well known. And also in the olden days, when the old kingdoms and kings, many of the kingdoms and kings had a toxicologist on their staff. Usually a toxicologist actually is called a poisoner. Uh, this poisoner used to eat the food before he feeds to the kings to make sure it is safe. And also, the, 
and also the kings use the poisoners or toxicologists to poison enemies. Again, that's a kind of a toxicologist plays different roles in the history of the toxicology. That is just a background information. Next slide, please. Okay, just to give you what a toxicologist does, you need to know, because I'm going to give, we have approximately 200 participants as of now, 190. You all can, can become a toxicologist in the field, but let me caution you, toxicologist is a very hard, very tough and committed life has to be there. My whole life I am committed, I did not change my field, you can see. So toxicologists study pharma compounds, biotech compounds, pesticides, industrial chemicals, food additives, colors, vaccines, cosmetics, medical devices. You can see the whole variety of different types of chemicals that a human being exposed, our environment is exposed, we are studying. So toxicologists are supposed to know all these things and you can't expect, you can expect a toxicologist of drugs separately, a toxicologist of pesticides separately, vaccines separately. Very few are there who are actually worked in all fields. Fortunately being, I worked for over 50 years in my lifetime, I practically worked in all these fields, which I will summarize later on. And also we are inter will be in the toxicized interest in genetically modified seeds, worker protection standards we establish, environment toxicology, and the toxicologists can also get involved in industrial accidents. Recently it happened in India, in Vishakapatnam, there was an accident that happened where toxicologists are called in to actually investigate and provide replies to that. Now at the bottom of the slide, you will see one in toxicology, another in agency. Always toxicology must and should work in consultation with agencies. Regulatory agencies are a fundamental essential component of a democratic system. As a result, agencies play a pivotal role and toxicologists help agencies in doing this testing. And obviously all of us, both the industry and the agency, is a servant of the public. We are the servants of the public. Our job is to serve the public, which is in the center at the bottom side. Next slide, please. Okay, now we can just to give you a broad overview of the world of chemicals. Chemicals, you can think, oh my goodness, a chemical, I don't want to touch a chemical. You cannot live a, live a life without touching chemicals. Chemicals are there in food we eat, the cars we drive, the clothes we, we wear, etc. The chemicals are everywhere. The modern life, even the older life, you can, nobody can live on the life in the medieval times and even today without chemicals. As we can, you can suspect, some chemicals are used to help people like medicines. And most people know that not all chemicals are good for them. Most people also know that high doses of the same chemicals or drugs which are beneficial can be harmful at higher doses. Uh, next slide, please. Am I going too fast for the audience? Am I okay? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what, what does the toxicologist try to find out? Some effects occur, you can find, uh, Toxicology effects of a chemical can occur at the site of application on the skin, whereas if it is applied like cosmetics or medical devices, and also the distant, once you apply the chemical, it can be absorbed from the skin or absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. The effects can occur in the GI tract where it is exposed and also to distant parts of the body in different organs, which you will touch later on. Some chemicals harm specific organs in the body. For example, the liver, the kidney, or the heart. Such organs are called target organs. We'll talk more about that in the next series of slides. So toxicologists in general try to find out which organs a chemical or drug can affect and how these organs are affected. Next slide, please. Okay, now toxicologists also try to find out the duration of exposure. For example, if I'm exposed, for example, a small amount of acid on my skin for a short time and I wash quickly, no effects, no harmful effects are observed. However, the same acid when I'm exposed on the skin, if I don't wash or don't have time to wash or no water available, no cloth is available to clean, 
certainly it can damage the skin. So essentially what the effects can be what we call is a long acute effects which are occur quickly, immediately, or exposed exposure effects can be seen chronically, a repeated exposure or long-term exposure. So we'll introduce the term in the next series. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, toxic, now coming to the laboratory animals. Uh, as we indicated, certainly it is unethical. Uh, go back to, the, uh, yes. Yeah, correct, thank you. Uh, toxicology says, you know, in the past, people have used prisoners and uh, in the people in jail to uh, use as a top in the species to test. Obviously, in the modern days, it is unethical, no matter how bad they, those humans are. So as a result, we use surrogates because animal species which have similar physiological systems. Toxicologists often find out the effects by collecting data from laboratory animal experiments. Some of you may have done it. We do routinely every day. Uh, we, we, the toxicologists use their skills to predict. This is a very important part. Not only do the studies in animals, but our, we should be able to predict the likely effects to occur in encountering humans for the same chemicals. This is one of the most hardest things. It's very easy to do a study, get data, but you don't know whether it is relevant to human beings, and we should have the experience, knowledge, to extrapolate the data from animals to humans. And lastly, most chemicals have a safe threshold uh, dose. Uh, I'm sure many of you heard the word uh, tetrodotoxin uh, or a tetanus toxin. That is harmful, most the deadliest chemical. But that can, if the exposure is minimized to the lowest level, it also can be safe. Next slide, please. Okay, now I talked about, introduced the word prediction in the before. Prediction is a very important part, part of the, a very important part of the life of a toxicologist and the regulatory agency. The, when we submit the data to the regulatory agency, they have the hardest part to determine how we can control, manage exposure to minimize the risk to people at large. And in real life situations, it is not just the toxicity of a chemical, we need to know the risk. As I said, using the tetrodotoxin example, if the exposure is minimized, it is not harmful at all. As a result, we need to find what are the conditions, even a toxic chemical, what are the conditions under which humans are likely to be exposed, accidental situations that I mentioned earlier in Vishakapatnam the plant export, uh, exploded. As if we need to have a control measures, plan control measures to prevent, even if an accident happens, how we can control, minimize exposure to the people in the plan. So now coming to the last part of the slide, the regulatory toxicologist. So half of my life, I, turned, I was a laboratory toxicologist. Now I'm a regulatory toxicologist. What does a regulatory toxicologist do? Assist in making regulations. I don't make regulations because I'm not a government employee but I help the regulators to make, to interpret the data, make appropriate regulations, give my suggestions and comments to them, to finding out the risk of a chemical, that is how likely the chemical is likely to cause harm in a situation. And finally, with this information, the regulators can make recommendations how to minimize the risk. Let me take the example of the pharma. Most of you are pharma graduates. In the case of pharma, Assuming, for example, I know codeine is widely used in the population, but we cannot give the codeine as a non-prescription item. Well, even though codeine is toxic, codeine is addictive, we control the exposure of codeine through prescription. Nobody can get codeine without a prescription. So that's how it happens. So that's how it's managed. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. Okay, good. Okay, now we are going one step deeper inside. Uh, for though, again, this could be very preliminary for most of you, but I'm suspecting there will be a few uh, participants who may not have enough biology. We always think uh, chemicals harm the tissue, uh, organ. We need to understand how the chemicals enter the body. Chemicals are exposed, always exposed to your cell. 
not to uh, not to kidney, not to liver, not to you know, all chemicals are expo exposed to your cell. Can you bring back the slide, please? Okay. Next. Next yeah, good. Thank you. So chemicals are first exposed to your cell. Every tissue has a cell, and once the cells are damaged, as more cells are damaged, then the tissue will be damaged. As more tissue than an organ is damaged, the organ damage happens. And finally, when multiple organs in a system fail, then the organ system fails. That's how the system works. Next slide, please. Now, toxic damage to the cell. Again, this is a very crowded slide. I will make it simple. I don't want to read all that. For example, this in the far extreme left side of your screen, you will see mild damage. Most chemicals produce mild damage, no question at all. Mild damage does not mean it is toxic, does not mean it is harmful for the long term. So when the mild damage happens, all body, all human beings or bodies, including animals, have an immense inherent uh, potential to to actually correct themselves or repair themselves. In the first example, cloudy swelling or a fatty change in the liver. So as I said, most livers have immense mechanism for repairs, though they do repair in the case of mild damage, tissue returns back to normal. Now we go to the second upper block, which is irreversible damage. When there's a severe damage, for example, you take, we, if, you, if I'm exposed to sulfuric acid and I'm working in a lab directly in the skin, there is no question, no amount of washing will help. Sulfuric acid is going to kill cell, skin cells. So under those conditions, producers, cell death is called necrosis in the angle. That's what happens. Now in the case of the third case, where nuclear, where nuclear or cytosolic, uh, cytosolic, cytoplasmic shrinkage happens, their apoptosis or a natural death of cells happen. In the last block on the right hand side, you will see non lethal damage only to the DNA, the nuclear material. When such a thing happens, that means whole organs look normal, have human beings look normal, animals look normal, where there is a damage to the nuclear material, chromosomes damage, then you have a change in the growth pattern which will result in cancer. Many of the chemicals, which are drugs, even, even some drugs, they do not cause any damage to any organ, but long-term exposure results in damage to the DNA, which results in change in the growth pattern, results in cancer. And this is the second deadliest disease after the cardiovascular disease in the wo entire world, including India. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, now the next two or three slides will be very familiar to the pharma graduates, but there could be a few people who may not have had the pharma. I introduce this. The concept of drug metabolism or absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. Just because you and I are exposed to a chemical, it does not mean it is going to cause harm. Always body is a dynamic thing. Blood circulation is very dynamic. And as a result, once the chemical enters the from absorbed absor absor either from the skin or from the gastrointestinal tract or finally from the pulmonary, from the lungs, it enters first compartment, enters in the plasma. The plasma, plasma results in distribution, dilution, metabolism, and excretion. So as a result, the very fine, few chemicals concentrate and produce a damage. Bulk of them is distributed and metabolized. Next slide, please. Again, this slide is also very familiar, but uh, I have checked this slide many times. I gave a talk, live talk in the, in the pharmacy college. People could not answer. These are the three fundamental principles of passive diffusion. 95% of the chemicals in the, that we are exposed in the, to our body, they always pass through passive diffusion. What do I mean by passive? Passive diffusion is the directional uh, transfer of material from a, from a solute, from a high biologic concentration to the low biologic concentration. Always it is concentration gradient, gradient dependent. And in addition to the concentration gradient dependent, the following three factors, very crucial, 
very important affect the concentration of the chemical that reaches any particular tissue. Number one, lipid solubility. If the material is highly lipid soluble, it crosses the membrane. As all of you know, all biological membranes contain lipid bilayer, lipid protein. The material which is highly lipid soluble crosses faster compared to the other way. Number two, molecular size, very important. Smaller the molecule, molecular weight crosses much faster. <laughs> Excuse me. In the case of most small molecules or drugs that you and I are taking, they are all small molecules. Molecular weight in the range of 200 to 800 in that range. But once the molecular weight rises above 1,000, about 3,000, very little is crossed because of the molecular size, irrespective of the lipid solubility. And finally, the most important of all three is ionization. Only a drug that is non-ionized is absorbed. That's very important. Once the drug is ionized, for example, acid in an acid environment in the stomach is ionized. It's not absorbed at all. When the acid reaches this end, intestine where the pH is alkaline, it is not ionized, it is absorbed. Very important, thank you. Next slide, please. Now we are moving to again another part of the, the drug metabolism. Most of the pharma graduates already know. There are two types of enzyme systems in all mammalian systems. One is called the phase one metabolism, oxidation, reduction, hydrolysis. All these things are result in transformation of a chemical A to chemical B. By and large, 90% of the transformations are result in deactivation. But there are isolated about five to 10% of the cases where phase one metabolism can result in a toxic entity. By and large, in the phase two, the phase two is usually a conjugation. By and large, uh, practically all 100% uh, of the time, conjugation results in a decrease in activity, decrease in biological activity, decrease in toxicity, decrease in pharmacological activity. Generally, both phase one and phase two metabolisms result in making the drug more soluble in aqueous medium so that it can be eliminated from the body. Next slide, please. Okay, now th these are very important factors. Uh, uh, both pharma graduates know, but for the benefit of the, those who have missed it, I want to enter it. Once a compound enters the stomach, it enters the stomach, it goes to the intestine where it is absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. It first reaches not the blood, it goes to the liver first. So that is called the enterohepatic circulation. From the, once it reaches the liver, it can be eliminated yeah, directly into the bile. It doesn't have to enter the systemic circulation. This is called the first pass effect. Some, most of you know this. And now in terms of metabolic fate, 95% of the compound undergo first order chemicals. They are do concentration dependent. Whereas the, their zero order example alcohol, very few, they are mediated by enzymes. As a result, the concentration is, depends upon the amount of the enzyme that is there available. Next slide, please. Okay. Now from here on, I want to talk about the drug development process. How toxicology is used in drug development. As you can see in the top part, we have the non-clinical, which is pre-animal or pre-clinical. They are all similar names. On the right-hand side, we have the clinical. In the early phases of a drug development, you see non-clinical plays a bigger role. As it comes down to the clinical, the, non the animal data becomes less and less. Nevertheless, it still goes on for a long time. After some time, midway through, the clinical takes over and clinical uh, data becomes very significant, both in terms of the volume and in terms of the value. At the bottom side here, I want to introduce the introduce a concept, some of, most of you may know it, which is called IND. IND is an abbreviation which stands for Investigational New Drug Application. It is across the world, it is essentially the same, but different countries have a different uh, acronyms. So Investigational New Drug Application is, a, is an application or a petition that the drug company, like for example, that Ready Lab, Glenmark, Brand Baxi, or Sun Power, these companies, they actually develop the data package and make a submission to the clinical, to the agency in the form of an IND investigation, new drug application. After that, the agency takes some time to review and use an approval to do clinical studies. You can see when the midway through the clinical study starts. 
clinical studies, most of you already know, is done in phase one, phase two, and phase three, which I'm not going to dwell too much because my talk is only preclinical. So after the completion of the phase, uh, all clinical studies, during that time, a lot of uh, animal studies are going on. Then the companies file what is called as a new drug application, NDA. Uh, so once that is filed to the agency, which will come back later on in my presentation, they take approximately a year or so to review and then give the final approval for the drug. Next slide, please. Okay, drug develop. What are the objectives of drug development? Psychologic point of view, I'm not covering the others. Drug development is neither simple nor linear. Objective of the drug development process is to kill the bad candidate as early as possible. Because as the kind as the drug development stays longer and longer, we spend we spend more money, more resources, more people, more departments. As a result, because if we know the drug is not going to make it, it is better to kill very early. No question at all. So provide some feedback to the discovery as scientists, how to change the synthesis of the compound and increase the likelihood of a success. To advance the compound in the drug development process, we need a lot of people in the, in the various departments by preclinical, pharm pharmaceutical science, preclinical um, scientists, and regulatory scientists are required. So now in the drug development process, failure is the norm. I have a slide coming up where it takes an example of a 10,000 chemicals. We'll be lucky we come up with the one drug. So failure is a norm. Always you learn from the failures and apply that knowledge to the next development process. Next slide, please. Okay, now I will introduce a few terminology which I already explained earlier in toxicology. We call it acute. Whenever we say it is an acute effect, that means it is an effect observed approximately within 24 hours after application or one single exposure observed at a later time effects. Now the second word is a subacute. If the, when the exposure occurs repeatedly for from one week to one month, that's what subacute. If the exposure occurs from one month to three months, we call subchronic. And finally, if the exposure exceeds three months, as long as after two years or a lifetime, it's called a chronic exposure. These are the terms we are used to, so I'll be using later on. Next slide, please. Which I introduced earlier, the liver, the kidney, the brain, but sorry, go back. Okay, uh, we want to know what well, organ toxicity. Number two, we want to know dose response. Very fundamental, just like the pharmacology, the dose response is important. So is in toxicology. Dose response is very important. Always, you never do a toxicology study with a single dose. We always do minimum two, or preferably three, are in some cases four different doses. We want to make sure the effects observed as the dose is increased, is there an incremental increase in the toxicologic findings? In some cases of large molecules, we want to find is there any immunologic potency? Also very important, the last one, we are the people, toxicologists are the people, who determine what should be the first dose to be administered to humans based on animal data, which I have some examples coming later on. Next slide, please. Now coming to the toxicology studies. One of the most important thing is we are, we are not like rat, we are not like a dog, although we do have similar systems. Essentially, biggest thing for a toxicology space, space is what animals to use in toxicology. Even today, no toxicologist knows for sure which animals are good for any drug or any, any systems at all. We have some basic experience, which we'll talk in the next slide. We take into consideration for animal husbandry, experimental data, background historical data, very, very crucial in toxicology. And based on the therapeutic class, we use different species. The ideal species in the middle, which will come back in the next series of slides. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, in the non-clinical or preclinical studies, we make some assumptions for clinical trial. 
all clinical studies or animal studies are done always in support of a clinical trials only based on the duration of clinical trial we do different studies which we'll discuss to some extent if we want to use the relevant species i'll come back later on where to predict the human biology to predict the effects toxic effects of humans we use high doses in animals to identify the adverse effect if for example if i use a study with a 1 mg 2 mg and 3 mg to rats or dogs nothing happens essentially even though the exposure to humans is only 1 mg but what happens with that by doing such a study we are not determining the inherent potential toxic effects as i said higher the dose you can produce toxic effect and some uh, objective of these to uh, toxicity studies the effects is to predict what can happen to human beings when we say human beings we are not talking of 100 human beings or even 1 billion indians we have 7 billion uh, india in uh, sorry 7 billion humans across the world a drug once it is produced used across the world not necessarily 7 billion definitely more than a billion people so among the billion people there will be a few sensitive individuals who can respond to even to the smallest uh, uh, amount of the exposure of the compound so animal studies by and large we use high dose to find out those inherent adverse effects they are very important now purpose is to characterize the toxic effects and characterize the dose identify the toxic target organ which i described and also find out how long does it take to find an adverse effect duration of exposure so all these things are taken up and the last two i will cover the last two bullet items then oel in the next slide next slide please next slide please ma go ahead okay very important is the dose and the dose response are very crucial in toxic art the route and frequency of administration to animals should always mimic human exposure if the humans are given in the tablet oral uh, like a tablet obviously we can prepare a tablet and give it to rats we prepare it to, to take the drug in a powder form make a solution or a suspension administ orally if the drug is given intravenously to humans we similarly we use the drug intravenously to rats and dogs and the frequency of administration if we know some drugs are given for example only 10 days we simulate that are some drugs given once a, once a day some are given two times a day we actually try to simulate in under animal conditions exactly similar as much as possible the level exposure of the is always clinical it should be defined that means before we start a animal study we need to understand what is the clinical plan what is the route what is the frequency what is the uh, effects observed expected uh, we must know before we start any animal toxicity studies okay so now finally to justify the dose selection consideration should be given to the expected pharmacologic and physiological effect of the clinical of the drug in question and multiple humans should be uh, you, this will cover next one next go to the next slide please okay now very important where very few toxicologists unfortunately know have a knowledge of the drug metabolism just like most most of the pharma graduates have I'm waiting for the slide to come back. Slide, please. Uh, I'm unable to see the slide. Are the ten students? I can't see the slide. Are you working on it?
folks, we have 220 participants. Let's be use the time effectively. Yeah, good. Thank you. Make it full screen. Next slide. Yeah, next one. Okay, we just covered this. So essentially, finally, many uh, may conduct bio, bio, we and, and do what is called as a bioavailability study after giving what oral administration, see whether how much is drug uh, that is called net bioavailability. So we'll go to the binding studies next later on. Next slide, please. Okay, what we questions answered through, what are the questions we're trying to answer through these animal studies before we go to the clinical? These are very important questions that toxicologists must be cognizant of and should be able to develop data to answer these questions as a minimum. Number one, what are the toxic effects in animals? What are the target organs? Again, some of this is a revision from the previous. And how do the toxic doses compare with the effective dose? At this stage, go to the chart on the right-hand side. You'll see most of the time, the effective dose is in the green that is presented, very tiny. Most of us are taking, on average, 5 to 50 milligrams of a drug pill. That's all we are taking. We are very rarely exceeds 100 milligrams at all. So you can see the toxic dose, usually toxicity of the same drug occurs at a much, much higher, orders of magnitude higher. So we'll come back to the risk causes later on in this the next like, couple of slides. Now, the next question to ask is, can the toxicities monitor? Very important. Monitored in animals. Are they predictive of clinical situation. This is a very fundamental one. And for this, we need a lot of, person has to have a lot of experience with working with a lot of drugs, a lot of pesticides, a lot of chemicals. Now, are these, even though we know it is toxic effects are observed in animals and they can occur in human beings. The next question is, are the toxicities reversible? Very important. We always do those studies in animals and predict the human beings. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, next. Oh, good. Okay. Next slide. Okay. Uh, questions. So we, we just here I'm giving some publication. Uh, what happened is now we, we already learned toxicology studies in general. I, I taught, talked about the prediction and uncertain species. Uh, one paper was published, I'll come back in the next slide, about which involved 150 compounds and 220 different types of hu human toxic events. And they have all the characteristics listed before and down here, which covers in the next slides. Next slide, please. This is the publication. This is a publication anybody can see, the wonderful publication. Every pharma graduates must read it, which show which gives concordance of toxic toxicity of pharmaceuticals, the humans and animals. Very important paper. Uh, this I'll present in the next slide, the data. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide shows how, assuming, for example, we do toxicity studies only in rats. The bar in the red shows rat studies only. The prediction from rats to the humans, we are talking of roughly 45%. That means if we do only rat studies in 55% of the time, we cannot det detect or predict the toxicity that occurs in human beings. That is very bad. However, if the next bar, which is a slightly minus, uh, low red, it's called the toxic non-rodent or typically a dog or a monkey. If we do only dog studies, yes, it goes up a little better. It comes to 50. That means dogs are relatively better predict 50% of the time. But still, the remaining 50% of the human beings, we cannot predict. Now go to the third bar, which is a blue bar. If we do both rat and dog, rat, and dog, rat rodent and non-rodent, we are able to predict 75% of the time. That is much, much better than 45%. There is absolutely no guarantee we'll ever predict 100% at all. However, there are cases where they have done more than two species, which is any species, usually monkeys. All three species combined were able to predict almost close to 80% of the time. There is no way under any condition we can predict 100% of the time. As a result, this level of uncertainty is there in drug development. We must live with. There is no other choice. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, non-clinical development, we are talking about what are the types of studies we do. We choose the species. We choose the species based on the therapeutic area, 
based on the chemical, pharmacological effects of a drug, therapeutic effect, and choose usually it happened. Most regulators started. We always choose one rodent and one non-rodent. Rodent being a rat or a mouse. Non-rodent, typically dog. In some cases, non-human primates. In many cases, some cases it can be mini pigs. And some people have done studies in baboons also, very rarely. So essentially, if what we, we came to the conclusion, we can never save all human beings. We can never predict all, uh, save uh, toxicity to all 100% of the humans. If we do studies in a one rodent and one rat and a dog study, a non-rodent, it is usually comes to 75% is good enough. As a result, clinician is always in dark. There is always an uncertainty when we test first time the drug in human beings. There are a lot of episodes that have happened, a harmful effects, adverse effects, which I'll come back at the end of my talk. Now the comes to comes the metabolite. In some cases, the drug is metabolized and metabolite can be toxic also. We need to understand and do such study. And finally, choose the most sensitive species and duration studies. Duration studies is always based on the duration of exposure in human beings. In the early phase one trial, when we are testing the drug for safety in normal human being, typically test for approximately a week or two weeks maximum. As a result, in the early studies, when we do in animals, we do minimum two weeks or preferably four weeks so that we go slightly longer than a human study. Typically, 28-day study has become a duration of choice in the early stage and must cover duration of clinical trial always. Next, next slide, please. Okay, and when we start these studies, rat, a dog, or a monkey, whatever it is, we, if we, over, we are monitoring over 100 different parameters in a study. It's a very complex study, a lot of data is generated. A toxicologist must be knowledgeable, must be shrewd enough to look at all the data and make a conclusion and prediction to human beings. We measure all clinical signs every day, just like a doctor observes for a, a physical observation. We measure the body weight, food consumption, hematology, clinical chemistry. You're coming here, typically when you go to the doctor, he, the nurse draws approximately 20 ml of blood. We don't have 20 ml in a rack. So we have device systems and equipment where we draw only one and a half to two ml, less than two ml. And actually we can do the exactly same measurements as it is done by the in human beings. We do the eye exam, a blood pressure, ECG, necropsy. That means we stack it in all toxicology studies. Those who don't like to kill, please don't become a toxicologist. Every animal must be killed to find out what has happened inside the body. We may kill the sacrifice or kill the animals and observe every single organ. Typically, four zero, 40 to 45 organs are observed. Do we process the tissues and examine under the microscope? That's done by the pathologist. As a part of the toxic eye study, after giving the drug, we are a chemical, we measure the concentration of the drug in the plasma compartment. That's called toxicokinetics. Now, finally, pathology. And then I earlier talked about the recovery. We always do it in a toxic eye study we do of a 28 days duration. We expose the drug for 28 days. And we this is a sub main toxicologic group. We have a subset of animals after exposing for 28 days, we allow a minimum two weeks, or some cases four weeks of recovery to find out whether the toxic effect observed at four weeks are have they recovered or are they on their way to recovery. Next slide, please. Okay, now we talk. I left earlier the, some the acronyms of NOL we'll discuss here. After having done the toxic eye studies of a 28 days duration or whatever, or two years, we get a millions of data points in a two year study couple of usually two to three million data points. We take, we take a look at it and find out what is the dose it produces an effect. And there is always a dose, as I mentioned, multiple doses are used. The low dose typically does not produce an effect. So the dose, which the low dose or some dose at which did not produce any effect, that's called no observed adverse effect level, N-O-E-E-L. We also establish what is the effect observed for those that have produces toxicity, maximum tolerated dose we determine. Based on the NOEL, we determine the safety margin, which I'll come back in the last two, two three slides. And determine target organs, gender specificity, very important. There are some drugs that are uniquely sensitive to males, and so other, on some cases to females, we need to decide on that. Then assess reversibility we talked about. At this stage, 
we must decide tax rights is a difficult task of telling the drug inventor or the person who holds the patent, this drug is no good, you should drop it. He will miss a beat and some people get disappointed. So we toxicologists cannot please every scientist at all. So we need to be honest, we need to be objective, we need to be detached from the drug and tell clearly in unknown, uh, it's uh, definitely in clear terms whether it is a drug which is going to make it advance to the next stage. Now in most toxicologists, I, I, I covered all these things. We'll go to the next slide. Okay. Now, major issues in drug development. We talked about toxicology. One thing I did not cover, which I'll probably talk at this stage because some of these. So essentially there are three, in, in early stage of development, there are three different types of toxicology studies are done. One is called the repeat dose toxicology. I bulk up my time I spent. And there is another type, type of work, which is called mutagenicity. Mutagenicity are, these are chemicals which can damage uh, only the nucleic acid or the uh, chromosomes or the, or the genes. Those are separate tests. Those are typically in vitro. They can be also extended in vivo. Those are also very essential. Those are not, those, those are all single dose short term study. And the third and most important one is safety pharmacology. What happened in the based in the early 90s, there was a drug developed by Pfizer, uh, Merck, 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 Sharp and Dome which is called Vioxx in America. I don't know the Indian name of the drug for Vioxx. It went through all these series of tests. FDA reviewed everything. They said it's safe for an anti-inflammatory drug. It was a wonderful drug for people who had rheumatoid arthritis. Within one year, nearly a, no more than a dozen patients died of a cardiovascular block, heart block. As a result, immediately they went back what was wrong. There was a test that was not done, which is called cardiovascular toxicity which is telemetry which detects prolongation of the QT interval. So those I'm not covering, but are kind of specialized tests. So those are the three types of tests that are done for investigational new drug application. Now we'll talk about the major issues in this slide. Every function feels, in, in any, any time you're developing a drug, every person say, my goodness, my data is important, I'm important. So this kind of philosophy, I should be avoided in, we are not developing drug for me. We are developing a drug for the society at large, for the benefit of those who are suffering. As a result, we need to be objective, as I mentioned earlier. There is no need, there is a, there is a need, very, a very important need in all, all companies across the world, not just India. It is, I have worked for 40 years in United States, it is the same problem, uh, because they're same human beings. So there is a need to integrate every departmental activities to make sure there is a multi-departmental coordination, a review happens, discussion happens, argument happens, finally come up with a decision which is, makes scientific sense, not humans. And it doesn't matter who, who is right or who is wrong. Now, every function needs to understand there is their point of view. So again, these are all the things I listed here, not important for me to go over every one of them. Very important is a, a thorough discussion must happen during development, very objective. Next slide, please. Okay, why now we'll cover, we covered the drug development. We asked the question, why, the, uh, re, what are the reasons for drug failure? I talked earlier about genotoxicity or mutagenicity is the same thing. Typically mutagenicity is a test that are done is AIMS test, in view of positive uh, genotoxicity test. These can be positive. These are short term tests. They, if they turn out positive, we have a, we have a, it's not a death of the drug. It is a big red sign. We need to resolve it. In some cases, it's so gross, multiple or, uh, tests show positive, it must be dropped and go back and tell the discovery scientists, come back with another alternative drug in the same class, we'll work it out. Cardiovascular safety, I talked about the Vioxx and the Merck drug, which came on the market within one year, it was withdrawn. So the, that produces a, what is called as a QT prolongation in the electrocardiogram. Now the third one, which is very common, 95% of the drug, there is no drug which is without a target organ toxin. This 95% of the drug will have some toxicity in some organs at some dose. As a result, based on the observations, we make a recommendation to the uh, clinician and the clinician in turn makes like a recommendation on the label of the drug, do not give this drug to such patients. Do not give this to females or males or children. So those decisions are made by the clinician, by the companies, 
and finally by the regulatory agency and then to make it whether it's a prescription or the over the counter all these are control measures how to minimize the risk now we'll go to the next slide please okay now we'll come to the regulation uh, i know all of you are in, within india but most indians are very knowledgeable around the world unlike other countries i have come across very nice because after coming from us i found out indians are the most knowledgeable in terms of diversity of knowledge so just to introduce uh, us fda that is my favorite is the most important agency in the world which becomes a symbol of regulatory guidance for all across the world because they have the longest and widest experience of developing drugs and reviewing drugs so now we'll come to the epa which is not important environment for this audience environment product agency which handles industrial chemicals and pesticides now the next series of them are indian uh, agencies uh, food safety authority of india fssai which is in india which happened in 2006 very good agency which is able to regulate foods and chemicals in foods now the most important one for drugs for the farmers graduates is dci drug uh, that reviews all petitions except uh, large molecules which are which are called uh, biologics cib which re regulates the pesticides Cent central insecticide board and the last but one is dbt indian one De uh, department of biotechnology which handles biologics and the final one is ema european medical agency is present in the united uh, in the europe just like the fda in the united states these are the agents which regulate control manage this, uh, the marketing of the drugs next one please okay uh, this slide is we'll avoid because we have this more of the clinical side which i am not going to cover okay okay now the regulatory consideration as in in the drug development is although i am a toxicologist i'm talking of toxicology i want to make you aware of there are more than toxicology areas which are as important as toxicology cmc chemistry manufacturing control chemistry synthesis impurities bulk production this is the single most important thing very very important compilation of all the toxicology data in the ind very important early clinical development plan and the rationale and investigation brochure these are all the very important components of a drug development plan in after having developed the drug you prepared a package submitted to the invest to the agency to any agency either the fda or to the indian agency we need to be constantly in touch with the agency to find out what is their concern and always never hide the uh, effects you observe never hide your concerns in the in the agent in the package when you present you present the full data and your interpretation of what the issues are the issues must be brought up you never hide the issues in the package and discuss with them these are our issues we would like to know what the agency's views are and always have a pre ind meeting with an agency whether i don't know whether it's not not very common in india you usually go one on one with the, uh, some scientists but in united states and ema europe it's very common to have a pre ind meeting then when we submit the ind then we we should maintain which is annually we should maintain annual reports ibd stands for investigation brochure for the clinicians and ind amends as required next slide please okay now i am changing from a drug development i interaction with the agency to a totally new area which is also toxicology because risk assessment after having developed the data our object is to see before we go to the agency is there a risk with this drug so i want to introduce the concept of risk assessment what is risk assessment risk assessment is is defined as the probability of an adverse outcome based on the exposure very important exposure is important as i told you the dose is very important and potency of the hazardous agent so risk assessment is a systematic scientific evaluation of the exposure and the effects and coming up with the recommendation what is a safe dose and what are the conditions under which it is safe what precautions one should take what are the labeling instructions what are the la label insert that goes inside what information communicated to the physician what information physician should communicate to the patient all these things are developed in this so next slide three four slides will talk about risk assessment go ahead next slide please okay i already talked about the no observed adverse effect level earlier which is a dose that did not result in toxicity in 
any animal in any study at all. So this is the, usually the highest dose level that did not produce any effect. The obtained from a most sensitive species, rat or dog, whatever, will come back in next slide. Select from the study with the most appropriate endpoints, very important. Next slide, please. Again, here, a lot of experience is required. Now, what we do is in the, it, uh, we add what is called as an uncertainty factor or a safety factor, both are same. So we take the NOEL on the top level from the animal studies observed. We apply a divide by a safety factor of 10. Why we do? We, because animal studies, we want to extrapolate to humans. We have uncertainty. And you pharmacy people know very well, animals have a higher metabolic rate compared to humans. So as a result, the animals can metabolize faster. So very little can be exposed to the human, uh, to, in the humans, in the human situation, metabolism is low, exposure can be high tissue. As a result, we apply the tenfold safety factor. Let's say, we'll come back to the next slide, it will show with the, uh, with the actual numbers. Then we'll divide by another 10, we want to, because variability, no two human beings, even two brothers and two sisters are identical. They respond differently to some drugs, not all drugs. As a result, to account for human variability, we apply another safety factor of 10. So essentially, we apply 10 times 10. We take the NOEL, divide by 100. That is the dose we recommend. This is the dose that should be administered to humans, humans, or that should be the dose that should be safe to humans in the case of patients. Now, that is that dose is called the reference dose or acceptable daily intake. Next slide, please. Okay, this slide shows you in a so numerical way how we arrive at. So we did a series of studies for a drug X. We have subchronic studies in dogs, chronic studies in mice, chronic studies in rats, reproduction studies, all these studies. You can see NOE, every study, when you complete, at the end of every study, you must come up with the NOEL for that study. We make a table like that. We, show, we look at what is the lowest number results in NOEL. We never take the highest. That means we take the dog as the most sensitive species that resulted in a low NOEL of 10 milligram per kilogram. Next slide will show you how you we use this number to come up with a safe dose. Next slide, please. Okay, we use the safety factor or the acceptable daily intake is a formula NOEL divided by the safety factor. NOEL was 10, as you can see example down, NOEL is 10. We take the NOEL 10, divide by 100, comes with 0.1 milligram per kilogram body weight. This is in the rat. Oh, we already applied a safety factor. You and I are not taking drug in milligram per kilogram. We multiply by 60, 60 kilogram average human being. We, come, we tell them six milligram per human per day is a safe dose. That's how we arrive at the safety margins. And this is also a part of the toxicologist's job. Although this, this person who does risk assessment not necessarily did the, does animal studies, but has a knowledge, experience in doing the risk assessment, somebody like me. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, now I'm coming to an example. This is a very classic example that happened in 2006, uh, which is a drug called TGN1412. It is a monoclonal antibody, anti-inflammatory drug, uh, the drug company has done extensive studies, rats, dogs, monkeys, every study. It has gone through all the reviews. It has gone to the agency in England and they approved it, they approved it as safe. Big surprise. Six patients were administered the drug in London hospital, uh, in a clinic, and all six people within one hour developed swelling, extensive swelling of the legs, swelling of the neck, swelling of the body. Why? That's called a cytokine storm. Cytokine, what, why it happened? Why, obviously they went to the immediate uh, emergency care and finally they all recovered, but this is an unfortunate situation. So why it happened is the cases, you can see the last uh, paragraph. The uh, CD28, is, uh, these are the uh, lymphocytes, uh, that results in activation of the CD4 cells, affect our memory cells. So that mechanism of activation did not exist in the rat, did not exist in the dog, did not exist in the monkey. It occurs only in the, uh, in the human. It's possible if you had done a study in chimpanzees, it's possible you could have detected, but nobody does. There are very few chimpanzees to do around the world. This is an example to show you. There is no species which is good for all the drugs all the time. 
there is always surprises happen. We always must be prepared to work, with, deal with the surprise as we are doing with the COVID-19 right now. Next slide, please. Okay, now I, I told you earlier, I'll come back with the numbers game of success rate. If it starts with the 10,000 uh, drugs or chemicals in a screening discovery area, approximately 250 enter the preclinical or animal phases. That results in approximately five candidates on the right side column, uh, arrow there. You results in five drugs entering the clinical, clinical phase one, phase two, phase three. We will be lucky, honestly, we'll be lucky if five of them result in one drug that can be approved or marketed drug. This is again a very optimistic, typically more like 100,000 chemicals you can start off, will come up with a one drug, so-called blockbuster drug. And on average, it takes a minimum 14, 15 years to develop a drug. Although I should tell you, these days, very few fall in the category. These days, almost 50% of all drugs that are coming in the market are biologics. Biologics have a shorter half-life, uh, shorter length of uh, 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 testing because biologics do not cause the same toxicity as small molecules, which I'm not going to cover in this. So you can bring a biologic within two to three you know, years. Next slide, please. Okay, now why compounds fail in development? We are coming to towards the end. I have only three more slides. So what most of the compounds, bulk of the compounds are poor bios, biopharmaceutical, guys. It is the biopharmaceuticals, your area is the most important. Close to 40% of the drugs are failing because of lack of bio, good biopharmaceutical development. Essentially, you are the most important people in drug development. Toxicology, only 20%. Commercial success, you can have, you can have everything right, but commercial says, guys, we just found out a, a drug similar type has been just marketed last month by Pfizer. So our drug is, even though it is effective, we cannot make money. As a result, we have to drop this drug. So this one. Uh, almost 30%, unfortunately, after having done, done all the preclinical studies and clinical efficacy, in, after that, still 30% of the drug are failing because of efficacy. This is unfortunate. Because we human beings are very diverse, 7 billion people, even two brothers and sisters can be different. As a result, they do fail for various reasons. Next slide, please. Okay, well, this is again a summary of the previous one. We don't need to go through that. Numbers speak themselves. And all of you can get the slide I shared with the, uh, Dr. Venkatesh. Next slide, please. Okay, this uh, shows you how different agencies around the world take different times after having submitted the full NDA, new drug development package, which consists of CMC, uh, preclinical and clinical aspects. And so after giving that, on average, if you, if you see at the bottom, uh, it is taking one and a half years on average. In the case of Japan, it's taking two to two and a half years. That is the most uh, agency, I don't know whether <laughs> really efficient or not, but they are the longest agency. In spite of being approved in the US or India, they take a longer time for whatever reason. So on average, it's taking one and a half year after having submitted the data package before it is marketing approved. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is my last slide. Final message is drug discovery and development is a cross-functional multidiscipline program. Every person working in a drug development, whether pharmaceutical people, chemistry, manufacturing, synthesis, de preclinical development, efficacy people, drug metabolism, all are equally important. If one number, one of them does not function, good science, good judgment, the drug is a failure. As a result, you may have the best scientists in the, well, all the areas. If one area is weak, you are, a, you are a failure in the drug development. Success should be driven by applying industry best practices, no shortcuts, no uh, cover-up, as absolutely no-no in the drug development. Very important, all companies, drug development must create integrated efficient drug discovery objective for people in the development program detached from the drug detachment. their good goal should be to get the best drug best testing and best drug to the market establish high performance highly collaborative project 
very good planning and management is very important. Leveraging relationship with other institutes, very important. Most of the drug companies, I'm just using example like uh, Pfizer, Drug Ready Lab, Sun Farm, hey, we know everything. Wrong. No company knows everything. You must always leverage, think, is, is it possible I missed something? Always consult a professor in a university, he or she knows more, or may know, at least give it a try, give a second opinion. So always use other institutes, education, research institutes, or consultants, retired regulators. You always must get a second opinion before you become confident. Never be overconfident in drug development. As I indicated earlier, after having marketed the drug within one year, they fail, they come back. It is better to fail the drug before uh, spending too much money. So with that, I want to stop and allow any questions if the, if the system permits. Thank you very much. So we have a few questions from the chat box. Uh, these are international students from SRM University's question is, what's your view on toxicology after being in the field? And what principles do you see as most important? Uh, madam, uh, your, your voice is not clear to me. I, uh, is there a written question I can see uh, if I click QA? No, I don't know. So can you hear me now? Am I audible to you properly? Uh, sorry, I'm, uh, I'm unable to. I, voice is okay. Or voice is good, level. Mm -hmm. But the clarity to me is uh, less than optimal. Shall I repeat that? Or is that okay? Because you cannot read the question. Uh, okay. I, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm not audible to you, is it? Yeah, you are audible. Can you go a little slower? Maybe I, words are not clear to me. Uh, go oh, okay. little. Yes. Uh, so there is a question that you know a person is asking. What is your view on toxicology after being in the field? Uh, so I thank you uh, on behalf of Arjitya Pani and Mr. Kostanaki and Mr. Kostanaki for giving us an opportunity to listen to Dr. K.S. Law and uh, I thank our chairman Dr. B. Rishkuma for giving us a platform to this is such a wonderful wedding. Thank you to all the participants as well. And thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your informative session.